Hello, and thank you for joining our Zero Trust-Based Remote Access for Operational Cybersecurity webinar. I'm Diego Laje, Senior Reporter with Signal Magazine, and I'd like to welcome you to this online event. During this webinar, U.S. Space Force and SAFE security experts will explore how a cybersecurity mesh-based approach combined with Zero Trust principles can enable secure digital access without compromising security. We will discuss how the distributed enforcement of security services on a per asset basis and distributed data protection services can improve resiliency across various systems. This webinar is approved for uh, one GX CPE and one CERT Nexus CEC for CyberSec first responders CFR and one CompTIA CU for A+, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, Linux+, plus, Cloud+, plus, Pentest+, plus, CISA+, plus, and CASAP+. Plus. Let's move on. Our speakers today are Colonel Jennifer Krolikowski, Chief Information Officer at Space Systems Command. She's Senior Material Leader for Space C2 and the Cross Mission Ground and Communication Directorate at Los Angeles Air Force Base. Colonel Krolikowski taught GPS and space acquisition when the National Security Space Institute was formed and later became the NSSI's Deputy Director for Mission Support. After finishing her tour at Air Command and Staff College, she was selected to be the Tactical Data Network Program Element Monitor on Air Staff at the Pentagon. She continued her career and studies and later became branch chief for integrated air and missile defense, global requirements on joint staff at the Pentagon. She then continued her Pentagon time as the director of staff and military assistant for DASD space, strategic and intelligence systems, office of the secretary of defense. Colonel Krolikowski graduated from the University of Dayton in 1996 with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering and commissioned from ROTC that same year. The next speaker is Kip Gehring, is a senior executive with more than 20 years of experience in the defense, space, and utility and IoT sectors delivering industrial solutions for data collection, communication, and sensing. At Zage Security, Kip is responsible for go-to market initiatives for various commercial sectors and for defense. Prior to Zage Security, KIPP held executive positions in marketing and product management at ITRON, delivering some of the first IoT networks and critical operational management, security, and analytical software for the utility industry worldwide. Before joining industry, he was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Air Force for responsible. He was responsible for the management of research projects uh, that delivered capabilities to the Air Force Space Command. Kip holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the Citadel and an MBA from Gonzaga University. Last but definitely not least, James Ebler has over two decades of technology and strategy development focus on the DOD's needs including information technology, as well as experience in enterprise as a service and zero trust architectures. He has contributed to the creation of organizational technology roadmaps through policy establishment, functional advocacy, and guidance planning. His career also included work with the US Army, where he held a range of technical and leadership roles. These are our introductions now. Just a few comments to get started. First, we will hear opening remarks by Colonel Krolikowski. The floor is yours, Hi, thank you so much, Diego. And, and thank you so much for inviting me um, to attend and, and participate in, the, in this particular webinar that we have. Um, obviously, as, as being the CIO for Space Systems Command, which is the acquisition arm um, of the Space Force, uh, we're very interested in um, keeping our, our assets secure, not only from, um, you know, the networks and, and how um, all of the data moves around in there, but also, you know, from a, based in the satellites um, that we have as well, too. So um, definitely uh, really appreciate 
um, being here and and all of this topic is very near and dear to my heart as we try and and move away from uh, a lot of the um, stovepiped kind of brute force way we've done security in the past and and how do we actually get more towards those zero trust types of principles um, that uh, the DoD is is also charging us to do uh, so um, again thank you very much back to you Diego thank you so much our second speaker will introduce the topic but please uh, bear in mind use the questions this will be an open session where we will uh, Q and a uh, with with the guests. So, Kip Garing, uh, please go ahead, introduce Zero Trust for us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to just uh, say that, uh, you know, along with uh, Colonel Krolikowski's sentiments, the uh, the industry is undergoing a, really a significant transformation right now as, as we kind of move from a network-centric uh, security type of model and considerations um, to deal with accelerated threats to one of uh, zero trust, and uh, you can uh, you can go to the uh, to the next slide. Um, but when we think about uh, zero trust, right now we're kind of in um, uh, in <laughs> in the marketing phase. Um, in the marketing phase, and uh, as they do that, um, you, there's also a lot of innovation that is uh, happening as well when it comes to uh, security. Um, this move from a network-centric model um, to a, um, a network-centric model to one of zero trust where the identity forms the perimeter is, um, um, is significant. It's significant for uh, customers um, and uh, industry that is trying to protect their enterprise, both their IT systems and their OT systems. But it's also, um, it's also important uh, for industry. Uh, for the longest time, industry has taken this approach to a network, uh, kind of a network-centric approach where um, access is granted um, you know, on a network. Uh, trust is implied. Uh, and with zero trust, that's very different. Zero trust basically is really about um, trust, um, and verify uh, once you're on the network. And so those types of architectures, the process that you have to go through is, um, is uh, something that uh, both IT uh, cybersecurity architects need to worry about as well as OT cybersecurity architects. And so when we think about zero trust, um, we think about the design approach, we think about the security model, we think about forming an identity for um, all asset classes. And for the most part, uh, today, Zero Trust has been focused uh, in IT. Uh, that's where we're seeing a lot of innovation. Um, that is where we're seeing a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, products coming online to provide Zero Trust network access, for example. And uh, not a lot for industrial control systems or for industrial IoT. And uh, that's part of the challenge that we're going to talk about today when we talk about the, the wider range of Zero Trust. Uh, but while also focusing on the key considerations that you need to think about from a from an access control perspective, um, James, um, would you like to share your thoughts on uh, zero trust and some of the things that you're you're thinking about? Yes, yeah, so you know, zero trust uh, has been the key word I would say from a DoD and federal space for the last I don't know eight months, right? So it, everything. Uh, DOD's funny character, right? So keywords come out and it's the nice shiny thing. And then we try to figure it out. And uh, right, we look towards industry to help us to figure that out. So I think right now from a customer perspective, uh, I think they're still trying to figure out exactly what zero trust is. Uh, as we know, right, it's not an in-state. It will never be an in From Ebler's perspective, it will never be an in-state. Uh, I think the uh, adversaries will always keep us on their on our toes. Uh, so we're going to have to be agile and flexible enough as we lay down this, what we call from uh, our perspective is a journey, right? To ensure uh, that everybody that is connecting to the network, uh, as you said, is not trusted, uh, but we ensure that their security uh, when they do connect, right, uh, that there's no lapse in security as, as they connect. 
you know, the big thing is, uh, from my perspective, I've been an IT guy for 20 plus, 25 plus years, right? The last thing that I ever thought about was uh, our operational uh, OT systems. Uh, and, and now it's come to light that, uh, you know, that's a big, a big fallacy that uh, we were never looking at. And, and so it's one of those that uh, we've seen it lately as the adversaries uh, are not only, you know, they'll always be in the network. How do we ensure that they're not uh, reaching into our OT systems, specifically our SCADA systems, the systems that really uh, we can't update, uh, things that we really don't have eyes on. And so I'm looking forward today to really have that discussion. I think at some point uh, along today, you'll hear me talk about the integration of IT and OT together. Uh, and, you know, again, that's one thing that we we still talk today that they're separate, right, and disparate. Uh, so I think uh, we've got to figure out how we bring those systems together. Uh, I know from a system administrator perspective, they would love to keep them separated. Uh, but I think uh, the journey of zero trust is really going to bring them together. So I look forward to uh, and I love the opportunity to talking with uh, Colonel K and you, Kip, on, on this uh issue that is standing before us currently um we have a number of questions and and i encourage everybody to start uh early uh typing into their dialog boxes the the questions for for our experts today um first and it's it's a question for the panel um what are some of the unique aspects of ot networks that may be different than traditional IT networks, how would the remote access for the IT be different for remote access for OT? James, would you like to maybe take uh, take IT and then um, I'll uh, talk a little bit about OT and then we can have uh, Colonel K share operational thoughts on that whole picture. Sure, so from a remote perspective, right, if I'm on an IT system, all I'm doing, well, I need to have access to many resources from a daily basis, right? And so normally right now, remote access is, I'm either, if I got a mobile device, we're utilizing things like Hypori to VPN in, and we use Cisco VPNs. Um, and so from an IT perspective, we're doing it from the network layer uh, and not maybe from a access layer, although we build upon it. Uh, and so I think from an IT perspective, Kip, if you could build right from sure. there onto the difference from an OT system. I think I've laid the foundation for you somewhat there. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, it's uh, what we're what we're seeing at uh, Zage Security is we, we, work, we work with our with our clients. Um, we're definitely seeing a move uh, in the industrial control system cybersecurity perspective. Uh, that move is uh, away from an air-gapped approach where you kind of lock down everything. There is no outside connectivity or access. Uh, people drive to the location um, uh, if they can. Um, and uh, that has slowly moved to uh, some partially connected type of sites. And in many cases, these industrial control sites are very distributed. Um, at these sites, um, what's interesting is they depend a lot on network filtering, uh, data diodes. Um, and while um, the IT uh, teams um, provide a lot of solutions uh, for remote access, as James described, the VPNs, um, what tends to happen there is uh, enterprises will put a, what they call a demilitarized zone, uh, a DMZ between the uh, IT and the uh, control networks. And this is the uh, these are the connected systems that are uh, cyber physical systems where you're um, basically uh, you have automated operations where you may have a programmable logic controller that is uh, running um, running systems. And these systems, uh, if something goes wrong, if they fall out of tolerances, think centrifuges, think, uh, think the delivery of electricity, um, think actuators, things like that. Uh, if they fall out of tolerance, uh, there's safety, loss of life issues. So they're actually very sensitive to the type of security that they place in these, uh, uh, in these industrial IoT networks. Um, and as a result, um, access is, um, is a burden to the IT and the OT cybersecurity teams. And the reason it's a burden 
is these OT sites and the SCADA systems that make up these OT sites um, are typically very heterogeneous. They're uh, made up of multiple vendors. Uh, those multiple vendors will support different industrial uh, protocols and hardware from various vendors. And these hardwares and the protocols actually may have very limited uh, cybersecurity. So think of your, your Wi-Fi router at home. Uh, you don't log in like you log into your, your PC. Um, you log in with admin and then the uh, password that the manufacturer provided you. Some of these systems don't even have passwords. If you know how to address it in clear text, uh, the system will, um, will update its program. Um, so it's a very, a very vulnerable from a cybersecurity perspective. So and that's why there's been the resistance to actually allow access. But when access is required and it is allowed, um, what typically happens is in that DMZ between IT and OT, there will be a jump server um, and remote, um, remote operators will VPN to that jump server. In many cases, they'll need to log in again uh, from that jump server uh, with other credentials uh, to go into the OT site, uh, into the OT network and once in the OT network, they actually have quite a bit of freedom to move around depending on whether or not the company has um, spent money on network segmentation. And uh, typically uh, at plants and things of that nature, the networks are, are flat, um, but it, uh, it creates a lot of complexity that is, um, if not managed correctly, um, creates an attack surface. Uh, this attack surface can look uh, is created through uh, shared credentials. Uh, usually, um, there have been vulnerabilities associated with uh, an RDP session uh, as people come in. And of course, if you're VPNing into a DMZ uh, and you have an infected computer uh, with malware, all you're doing is providing a secure tunnel for that malware delivery uh, into uh, your critical operations center. Uh, and so, those are some of the some of the challenges with uh, with remote access just creates a lot of friction and complexity that uh, people need to manage. Hey, ma'am, not to put you on the spot, but from your your seat, right? I think it's important for the audience to understand specifically where you sit today, right? Uh, as, as Kip said, that uh, currently <laughs> most remote systems for OT, they got to get in a vehicle and go there and plug in. Uh, you're not quite doing that into uh, some of the, the items that you specifically are in charge of. Uh, and so from your perspective, is the way that industry uh, is looking at OT and how to secure it, is it actually going to meet their needs, uh, not only from your perspective, but overarching from an OT perspective? Yeah, so so for us, there's... Um there's there's a couple couple few things that are that are kind of going on and happening one obviously the the threat that we have and, and people wanting to get into our systems that's evolved over time and stuff too so a lot of the techniques that we used to use back in the day and still use in a lot of respect um are not necessarily sufficient anymore for that type of evolving kind of threat um, and so mo moving more towards the zero trust principles and, and working to adopt those helps do that and i think also um, to kind of your point earlier, it gives us an amount of flexibility to also then evolve as the threat evolves or how they want to, um, you know, the different intrusion techniques that start to happen or or any of those sorts of things, too. So that um, having that mindset of, of zero trust and what that can bring and how you protect your data um, is, is definitely, you know, something that we need to get after, which is, you know, why the DoD is as uh, mandating that we start moving towards those architectures. The problem is though, is that we've been building things for how many years now, right? And and not only on the government side, um, you know, where, you know, again, security may not have been always in the forefront or they were thinking about like, oh, I need to protect this SCADA system because if I can uh, get, if I, don't, if somebody gets into that network, they automatically have the rest of the DOD network you know, because of the way that things can loop and back hole into or back door into Then, like people weren't thinking about that because they were worried about like, I need to get the HVAC up, you know, so it I, I can I can understand and appreciate where um, those things may not have happened before. 
the the thing now though with everything being as interconnected as it is you know people want to get to things being more automated and being able to have remote accesses and um being able to um to to have uh, visualizations about what's going on with the system you know all of that are ones and zeros and there's ways to you know people are going to try and find ways to infiltrate that um so we if if you're involved in a one and a zero at all you kind of need to change your brain about cyber and what an attack might look like and how that can extend into other systems that you may be connecting into because of the nature of your of your system so um especially from like a, from an industry perspective, I love and want to use industry as much as possible, but I also need folks to start thinking of security as they're designing, as they're dubbing, as they're building um, and, and thinking about integration points. You don't need to think of everything you might need to integrate with, but as you are discovering integration and working in that, how do you secure from your point of entry to their point of entry and making sure that that is, is, um, taken care of. Now, obviously, like I said, we have a ton of systems that are out there already, and it's not even just SCADA. Like, think about, and I, I know everybody thinks about the satellites and, and whatnot, too, but the only way we can talk to the satellites is with our ground infrastructure. You know, we have the ground segments and, or the ground stations that are moving data around, so we have to have those networks. We have to have the, the, um, uh, the antennas that are, you know, receiving all the beeps and squeaks from those satellites and whatnot, too, and how that's moving around. Um, and in a lot of cases, those systems weren't, again, necessarily built with the most cyber secure mindsets. Um, and so that's where, like, okay, how do you start getting a legacy system um, converted into having some zero trust principles or being more secure in that respect um, so that they they can over make the whole overall ecosystem better? Or are we at a place where, okay, maybe we need to stop what we're, stop the madness <laughs> and, and start to build the new that has all of those things in there because we can get there faster. We can get there more secure than if we keep trying to patchwork um, everything that we're doing, uh, everything with, that we have with legacy. So um, I know there's a lot there and a lot to kind of unpack with all of that, but those are a lot of the things that I'm thinking of and like the trades that we're, that we need to make uh, in that respect. And, and how do we get that messaging out that this really is very important. And I mean, you've seen it in, um, you know, things going on in um, the Ukraine and with commercial and how they work on some of those pieces and parts. So um, it's, it's not just a military problem anymore. It is something that needs to be um, brought over into the commercial side. Uh, and then us collectively working and solve and, and um, moving forward in that together. Um, Cause otherwise, um, you know, the, the attackers are relentless. Uh, I, I think they, they love the challenge of being able to try and infiltrate a system. And we need to be able to remain flexible and counter that as much as possible. Diego, if I could have a minute, because Colonel Kay said an important thing there that we industry have to think of security up front. Right. So I could tell you that uh, we have, again, from my perspective, we've just now started thinking about any security as we build solution sets. Right. Back in the days, it was just give the government a piece of hardware and let them figure out the security, right? Uh, I think from an industry perspective, industry standard now, we are looking at uh, building the security into uh, the solution set itself. And that's where her second point, it's very important to sit down with the customer as we go through this to ensure that we're meeting all their security requirements. As it pertains to zero trust laying out this journey or this foundation, whichever we want to call it, right, uh, to make sure that we're meeting their requirements. Uh, and I see a lot of industry partners finally doing that, right? It's taken us a while to do that. Uh, but I think uh, with the dictation of zero trust itself, right, and how we're moving towards that, from a, even just from a federal perspective, right, um, I think uh, you hit your spot on, ma'am. And, and I think industry, we're, we're slow to react there, but I think we're doing a better job. Well, and I and I appreciate the burden that it does put on industry in some respect too, right? Because I, I I understand folks need to get their products out or their services out, and and you know in a lot of use case it may not it may not need it from the same level that the military side might dictate or require. Um, but if there's if there's any desire of that in the of uh, you know, from an individual that they want to get into more of the public sector, sector, especially in the DOD, please let's have those kinds of conversations and how can we help to, um, 
you know, help sponsor certain things or help like, hey, I know you want to get an aisle two cloud, but I can't do anything unless it's aisle five because I have a national security system over here. And just so that people are aware and understand what is that lift and what does it have to take and then decide if whether or not it, we are still a good fit to work together in, um, collectively and, and and as we're making sure we're secure going forward. Yeah, I, um, great points. And I was actually monitoring the, the questions, and I think you guys hit on some uh, points that are really interesting. Um, one was uh, getting the thought of uh, the convergence of uh, security access control uh, for things such as uh, multi-factor authentication, identity, and access management. And I'd like to just maybe share some of our, uh, sto our stories at Zage. Um, on, on this point, uh, because we work with a lot of uh, renewable operators on the civilian sector. And I think where the industry um, has adopted best practices, but where I would say the industry could maybe do a better job is they, they offer a lot of point solutions. Uh, I'm a specialist in identity and access management. I'm a specialist in privileged access management. I'm a specialist in uh, network segmentation or micro segmentation, which hopefully one day we'll get to zero trust. Um, and, um, you know, we do see, um, and that was kind of our mission um, starting out six years ago uh, at Zage was uh, that there is going to be a convergence. And we felt that convergence, and this is before the zero trust group was really going to take off. Uh, we felt that convergence was going to be based on identity and that the patchwork of uh, solutions out there that uh, corporations were forced to kind of put together and architect together were eventually going to break the bank. And so we took kind of a pro um, a, um, an approach uh, that was based on use case. And in this case, the use case that we're talking about today is uh, zero trust uh, remote access. But in that, in providing an end-to-end -end comprehensive solution where we go into, uh, for example, with some of our renewable customers who are operating, operating wind farms, uh, we move the workflow for technician access over from five to six different uh, cybersecurity solutions that all play a role to not even get them zero trust access, um, just to get them securely down to um, um, into the work wind turbine where there's still, you know, few few controls there. Um, so this, this comprehensive approach uh, is important. Um, and with this comprehensive approach, and, you know, we're here to talk about, uh, you know, cybersecurity mesh solutions and specifically this notion of uh, distributed enforcement, you can actually create uh, uh, a solution with a cybersecurity mesh approach where, a, um, where uh, when a user requests remote access, you can actually begin to proxy that access from the most trusted uh, area of the network, which is typically the OT site, to the least trusted network and emulate software in a way that the actual remote users are never in their browser. And once you establish that access control mechanism like that, you can overlay features such as uh, providing um, multi-factor authentication, not only as you access as a human, but you can get it actually down to the device level, whether that device is a, a legacy device or a modern device. And uh, we'll, we'll circle around on this uh, later on in the, web, in the webinar, but uh, Colonel Krolikowski is right. Part of, the, part of the challenge is, is she's got hybrid architectures that have are a mix of old and new. And so you have to go through the effort to create an identity and manage an identity for a legacy device, as well as a new device that might be serving up a digital certificate, for example. But it's very important when it comes to remote access to make sure you're not just tunneling someone in from a least to most trusted network, that you actually have the capability to tunnel someone from the inside out to overlay some of those convergence, um, the convergence functionality around fine-grained access control and multi-factor authentication that, uh, that Joey, Joey asked about the questions. So, Kip, from your perspective, right, so, you know, as it pertains to the zero trust journey, right, I've always been of the essence that identity and access management should be the number one thing. Forget the other pillars, right? We need to figure out the identity and access uh, 
management perspective because I think uh, as long as I understand who is getting to my network, right? As long as I ensure that Ebler is has he's the right identity and he's able to get access to whether it's a IT network, whether it's an OT network, and then I have actually. Uh, access to those devices off of my identity, right? Um, do you think that would be secure enough or no? I've actually need to have uh, certificates on the OT devices to actually ensure that it's, I guess, talking mm -hmm. with me myself, right? To make sure it's me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've, yeah, that, that's a that's a tough one to, to handle. And that's where we've kind of gotten into a, a combination of uh, approaches and thinking about that. Um, if you think about um, first, I agree with you, I think uh, you have to uh, everything's a risk management uh, decision. So when you go through the zero trust kind of journey, as you will, uh, you're going to have certain areas where your organization is weak, strong, things of that nature. But I do believe that one of the highest priorities is identity-based access control, because what you're really talking about is you're talking about protecting, protecting the operation and streamlining the workflow. And uh, if you could uh, maybe go to the uh, next slide, Claudia, um, just to give people a sense of the scope of zero trust. And um, that, that notion around access control, a very simple metaphor is uh, if you just uh, purchased a house, would um, as your first security mechanism, would you install locks or replace the locks there, or would you install a home monitoring system? Um, most people replace the locks, and they do that because they want to protect uh, what's inside the uh, what's inside the house and their their valuables. So I do think it starts with uh, identity, and I think it's protection. And one of the things that we uh, did in response to um, our customer needs is we actually um, provided a, a bump in the wire or a network filter that has the ability to create identities and then we'll create security policies for those identities. So we can allow them to, uh, if they want to, uh, we can allow them to basically, I call it retrofit zero trust uh, to a legacy device and uh, map the uh, security policy associated with identities of humans to whether or not they should have access to that device by combining uh, um, SDN network filtering and things of that nature to ensure uh, that uh, every interaction is uh, authenticated, authorized, and consistent with security policy. And the cyber hardening benefit that you get from that is if malware, whether it's through a thumb drive or something to that effect, or it's, you know, if it's uh, remotely uh, comes in, uh, if it starts scanning that OT network with this, uh, this network layer security in, uh, you can block access to that device and uh, prevent compromise there. And it gives you some time to respond. Um, we have a number of questions coming in. Uh, we'll, we'll take uh, Michael Brangwins. Um, he says, I always assume there is no magic solution that resolves all security issues. What is the biggest issue, obstacle, vulnerability, threat, not remediated by Zero Trust that will need a complementary solutions or model to Zero Trust to resolve? And this is for the panel. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to probably talk maybe kind of bump over into um, the cultural aspects of this instead. Um, it's not just about the tech, um, because I think the tech is there. Um, and there's a lot of people who are doing great things on all of those elements that Kip showed on that on that slide. Um, you know, the, the 50 or so different boxes of thing of things you need to account for to be you know, zero trust is a writ large. Um, but it really gets down to the culture of the organization and of the um, the people I, like on my side, like program managers during procurements. Um, and that they even are thinking about this stuff in the first place as they're doing it. So it's not like I'm just building a satellite and that's all I'm worried about. Like, or I'm building a um, an antenna uh, and that's all I'm worried about. Like, no, you have to understand and know the security aspects um, in there or at least 
bring in somebody like me and my team to be part of the discussions and the source selections and all of that sort of thing so that I can help show where the, some of the pitfalls are or like the questions you should be asking about security or or throwing the BS flag when somebody comes in and is just buzzwording death to you. You know, so I would say like that is probably one of the biggest things <laughs> to try and do um, and is maybe not like zero trust related. Um, but but that's but that's one of the big things that I that I see it and is something that we're working on. Uh, it's still not 100 percent, still not like completely there. But I think getting after that cultural piece and and having it be in a and. And, and one more thing before I, I give it up to, because I see James like, hallelujah over there. Um, but the other thing is, is that there is also a balance between security and functionality. And that discussion has to also be in place with the people that um, you're supporting and your customers about, okay, where's that balance? Because if I make things too secure, nobody can use it. And if I make it too functional, then there's, you know, you run the high risk of, of not, of, of people, of it being highly vulnerable. So um, I think having that, that feedback loop as well um, between the balance and, and having people make educated decisions then on the security and, and how things are going to get implemented has to be in there too, um, so that it isn't an all or nothing on one side or the other. Okay, there you go. No, so I think you hit it on the, so culture is a big issue right and and i think it's we're either to the left or we're always to the right we don't understand the balance of uh utilizing technical solution sets or capabilities to figure out mission sets we normally go one way or the other i remember back in the days right when a commander just needed to talk and the firewall wasn't working, guess what Ebla did, right? I'd bypass the firewall because the commander needs a tie. That's operations, right? And uh, and so we definitely need to think about, right? What is that right balance? And to Mike, uh, was his name Michael? Mike, I call him Mike. Is he going to get upset? So to Mike's point, right, is there is not one solution, right, out there. What there will be, in my opinion, is an integrated solution of multiple tools and probably going to go out on a limb here, right? And, and those uh, salespeople that are on this call are going to hate this comment, right? But currently, I believe DOD probably has 80% of the tools that are necessary to get this journey on its way. Now... Are we leveraging them correctly? By all means not. At one point, we bought a Cadillac version of a tool and we're only using the VW version, right? We, we've we seen this throughout. And so, you know, as, as we go, as I, as I talk to uh, my network of individuals, which are all warrant officers from an Army perspective, Air Force individuals, right? It's really having discussions on leveraging their current tool sets maybe just a little differently and integrating them into multiple solution sets and then going back and telling them the gaps right and in, in kip in your case right it would be more of the mesh where is the gaps within the mesh architecture itself right and so i think you know again I don't think there's there's definitely not one entity that will come in. And if there is one entity that says I can do it all, uh, as uh, Colonel K said, and ma'am, I, I would say your last name, but I would chop it up the whole time. So I apologize if you're taking offense. Um, and so I think if there is one person that says they can come in, as, as the Colonel said, she would definitely be in there saying the BS flag, right? Raising it because <laughs> right, she right. knows there is not one individual that can come in and do it. Um, but I think to that to that beauty though too, and um, you know, because because like I said, there's a lot of great tech out there, and there's a lot of really great ones that are focusing on like one or two of these fifty boxes, right? And so, how do we help bring all of those people together? for that integrated solution that is flexible and even containerized in some way so that I we can pop things in and out as the threat evolves or as the tech evolves or, or things like that. So, um, you know, I, I saw a comment in there like, you can't expect a small business to do like all 50 boxes. Um, 
Got it. I, I understand that. But that's why we have to have the conversations. And for particular use cases, which ones are the most important for us to go after for that particular time? And then how do we augment you with other companies or capabilities that are doing it so that we can integrate together and give us that that whole full solution suite? Okay. Yeah. Uh yeah, I wanted to add, just just work off uh, off of this question with another one, but Kip, it's back to you because we also have another question, saying you know with so many products, uh, marketing zero trust. Does the panel have any guidance on how to cut through the marketing buzzwords uh, that has been has been a topic present throughout this last discussion, Kip? Yeah, um, yeah, I do want to. Uh, yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely take that one um, and. Uh, I did want to comment just very briefly on the on the culture point uh, that was brought up earlier in the last question. Um, we are seeing some um, we are seeing some positive movement in this area of IT and OT convergence, and how CIOs at companies are thinking about how their OT networks actually do need to be cyber hardened. If you think about the uh, Colonial Pipeline and what what uh, happened there. Um, there's, uh, I see a lot of movement uh, in the DOD where they're, um, while they're not necessarily advocating zero trust for industrial control systems yet, because I don't think they think there's many tool sets out there uh, because of the focus on uh, zero trust in the IT sector. Um, I do think the threat of that is real. And I think the threat of that is both from uh, an outside cyber attack, but you also have to think of with these OT networks, shared credentials, um, you can't always physically protect those networks. Um, disgruntled employees, which is typically the number one threat um, to most uh, to uh, most organizations. Um, so the good news is, is I think there's some culture changing where we are seeing this IT OT convergence from how you're thinking about security um, and how you're taking kind of an end-to-end -end approach. Uh, regarding the buzzwords. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, actually. Um, I would say uh, I would say that uh, do your due diligence, um, work with uh, um, work with uh, companies that and integrators that you that you trust that can help you make the risk assessment of where your organizations, uh, what priorities that they should have, and then focus uh, both on the short and the long game, meaning. Um, uh, Colonel Korolikowski mentioned this, you know, there are a lot of small companies that do just one or two things uh, well. Um, but if you think about, um, you know, in our case, we have many clients where we're solving the zero trust remote access portion first. Um, but we also have the ability to uh, buy data integrity services, which um, are very important um, when you start thinking about a systems of systems approach and some of those major uh, architectural considerations uh, that uh, Colonel Krolikowski and her team work on. Um, so think both short-term and long-term game, uh, and uh, you know you have to do your due, due diligence. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll say um, work together. Um, bring the IT and the OT uh, cyber and operational experts together uh, to evaluate the technology, uh, insist on um, uh, it, insist on pilots uh, where you can see it in a in an operating environment to give you give you confidence because OT networks can be different um, than uh, IT networks in uh, how they have to perform and how often they have to be available things of that nature. I think I'd, I'd pile on a little bit there too of um, you know it. It isn't necessarily just about the tool. It's it's about the the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And and if if somebody's not willing to sit and kind of dis discover and frame with you and like figure out what is your workflow, what is your um, what is your end goal, what's your the end state you're trying to achieve from a functionality perspective, and like how to like things of like how it may help plug those holes for security. Like if they can't walk with you in that discovery and framing and, and actually help describe how they can plug, you know, these vulnerabilities or concerns that you have going through, then it, it's, it's probably more buzzword um, than anything else. At least that's kind of um, the stuff that I end up 
doing a lot is is part of like having that conversation and just like actually like are are you hearing are we speaking together you know all of those kinds of things too and i think it very quickly you can realize somebody who may not be a fit for your particular use case it doesn't mean they're not a fit for somebody else's so i'm not discounting anybody's tech there and stuff but you really i think need to have that discovery and framing first and foremost to see if it's um something that can work um, getting you to your end state goals ultimately. Yeah. So to pull the onion back, right. So, you know, being, it's all about operational effectiveness for me. Right. Ultimately. Right. Uh, if we're not fixing something for a customer, uh, then, then there's no need for me to be at the table. Um, and so I think a lot of discussion, right. If you start having discussions about just, and I'm talking because of this slide being up, right which pillar is important to you from an operational outcome perspective, right? And there are going to be different use cases uh, as, as the other panelists have said, right? So if I'm a, if I'm on a unit, a small unit and I'm mobile all the time, right? It may not be data is my important thing, right? My important thing is to have secure access because I'm on the go all the time. I'm in countries where who knows what network I'm joining, right? And so maybe it's mo mobile access, right? Which is important. And then, you know, from a, a data perspective, you could talk to an enterprise uh, data center type individual, right? And data would be very important to them that they've got to uh, protect or secure from this uh, perspective. And so I think it's gonna be really valuable and important to as Colonel K said, to sit down and have those discussions. If they start by just trying to sell you what they want to sell you, as in the one pillar, in my opinion, they're just talking the buzzword of the day for their from their perspective. If they're not literally in there talking from an integrated perspective, how it can actually make the journey easier for you from a customer perspective, uh, then, I, then I think that's... Uh, I think they're going down the wrong hole, right? And, and I think it is very hard, right? I remember with my hat on, it was very hard to uh, ensure that we were selecting the right products. There's a ton of products out there, right? And it is, it is so hard. And I think we've gotten away of doing uh, bake-offs, right? What we used to call bake-offs. I think we've gotten away from that. Maybe, maybe some still do that. Uh, I think we need to get back to that from a federal perspective uh, because then you're, in my opinion, you're, you're seeing the best of the best and ultimately, right. The winner should be the best of the best as long as everything in the realm is the same. Um, and so I think, uh, I think that's one of those that uh, again, it, it's hard uh, from a customer perspective, but I think every industry partner, and I do believe that every industry partner is trying to, uh, ultimately support the customer from uh, your foxhole. Uh, and I think it's it's a journey with, and that's where the partnering comes in, right? Uh, so it's very important to keep that open relationship, what I truly call a trusted advisor, right? Uh, and, and, and some people say that's a key word, right? But from my old CW5 ad, it is a trusted advisor that you're looking for that that they could care less what product you go with and really start talking capability instead and operational effectiveness. Yeah, I have uh, just uh, one one short thing to add to to that is um, uh, to the to the boxes and if someone says they can do all one column uh, because we took a, an identity based comprehensive access control approach uh, for our industrial clients, what we found was interesting is. Uh, over uh, over time, we had to uh, build a solution that actually, I don't want to call it cherry picking, um, but actually picks um, uh, these boxes off uh, in various areas across various pillars. Um, I mentioned earlier, we, uh, we don't claim to be a software defined networking company, but in order to block access to those legacy assets, there's attributes that we had to build into our, our fabric in order to provide ease of use for uh, industrial control and SCADA operators, um, ease of use for them to have a single sign-on experience to control uh, that access down to the device level 
and to orchestrate that, even when there's a complicated network architecture and you have to go across five or six network, uh, network boundaries. Um, so we've, um, we've done that as well as uh, privileged access uh, management uh, and identity management. But again, it was totally focused on being able to put the policy and the enforcement of the access control, um, whether it's remote or local, back into the hands of the operators and reduce the burden of, uh, of the IT cyber teams. We have a number of questions and um, we, uh, we're running out of time. Um, yeah. Diego, if I may, could we, we do have one last slide and I think it's an important slide because of uh, it was in the abstract for this, for this webinar. Um, could we maybe move to that slide? And yeah, this addresses one of the big questions we have. Um, Let's take it. Yeah, let, 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 please, Kip, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so this, um, this is um, an area um, where, you know, Zage, if, uh, you know, you Google us and look at our background, um, what, uh, what makes us a little different, there's a lot of access control solutions out there, um, is the fact that we were uh, the first company that took this concept of, um, for, for industrial control systems, um, that took this concept of having a central policy manager, but having the capability to uh, enforce the policies uh, in a distributed manner, even if uh, our fabric that's at the edge is disconnected from the policy manager um, or uh, the, uh, the source of the authentication, say Active Directory. And uh, when you think about uh, industrial control systems and how some of them get deployed, intermittent connectivity comes up. If you think about the mission requirements uh, for the military around resiliency, this fact of being able to run these uh, distributed um, enforcement security mechanisms at the edge uh, actually have a lot of value. And uh, this, isn't, uh, this isn't our marketing material that you see here, this cybersecurity mesh approach. This is actually Gartner uh, from last year, and this was their top strategic technology trend. So I think for the audience members, um, it's not just Zage, you'll see others come online that are recognizing the importance of not always having the authenticator or the security service in a central location, but to be able to take that policy, zero trust based policies or identity based policies and move them at the edge for things uh, associated with uh, edge automation, AI, situational awareness and space uh, to take action um, and things of that nature. Great. Um, I'd like to go to the, to one of the many questions we have um, for the panel, what are some of the other use cases of, or key features that should be considered uh, for OT remote access? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, uh, I'll take that. Um, so uh, one, being able to manage the identities and protect down to uh, the device level in a heterogeneous environment. Um, being uh, and doing it uh, from an overlay perspective, do not force the customer to make large scale network changes or rip and replace devices. Uh, you have to have the ability to orchestrate um, access uh, to include protocol breaks um, when you're hopping across uh, network boundaries and these network boundaries are designed to for best practices with reference design such as the Purdue model. If you're familiar with that where you uh, divide up the IT, DMZ, and the OT processes um, uh, along the lines of, you know, best practices. So having this, this multi-hop capability. And what we found from our customers, they have requested uh, video session recording. Um, so being able to record an administrator for um, uh, an administrator uh, accessing an application that they may be remoting into. Uh, and then ensuring that uh, you are moving um, once you authenticate you are moving from the most trusted part of the network to the least trusted uh, and running natively in, the, in, a, in a browser or getting IT out of the business of managing agents or VPNs on everyone's laptops just to give a few technicians uh, remote access. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that we've found uh, that our customers have asked for. 
equipped to pull it. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the Purdue model, right? As I've been doing a whole bunch of research with OT, IT, and how we should be merging these two together, right? Do you think the Purdue model uh, is becoming extinct? Do you think it, as we go down the IIoT path, right? Do you think the Purdue model is becoming extinct? I guess from your perspective. Um, I don't, I don't would say it's going to go, um, it's not going extinct. I think as you, uh, because there's so much brownfield involved and that's just a lot of infrastructure that you've set up. Um, but part of our value proposition is eliminating jump servers and replacing them with a, with a fabric node that can do these features that I just mentioned. But, um, I do think that, uh, if you look at it from a greenfield approach, uh, you will make different choices uh, in the adoption of zero trust architectures that will actually, I'll say, kind of flatten the Purdue model. Um, and uh, that could have implications. But we've had 30 years of building things <laughs> using the Purdue model. So it's uh, there's not many greenfield opportunities. Over. You're welcome for that softball. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we're running out of time. And before we go... Uh, I'd like to uh, invite Colonel Krolikowski, um to give us a, a, a few uh, closing remarks. Uh, uh, many, and, and one little note before that, uh, we have a lot of questions. Our team will take them, will address them and, and give them and distribute them to the, to the appropriate, uh, appropriate speaker. Uh, but please, please uh, Colonel Krolikowski, uh lend us a minute. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, again, you know, I appreciate being able to take this time with with everybody and and uh, my fellow panel members and, and really kind of talk through some of this. Um, hopefully, it's it's helpful to kind of get where, you know, at least my brain is kind of <laughs> focusing in and through. Um, but but really, ultimately, like I, it, it's something a problem we're all going to face, and I think industry is is starting to face it uh, much more so. Um, and, and, and in multiple of their sectors, like even ones that you may not have thought would you, um, were going to be vulnerable or going to be an industry point for, for folks. But as we get more into like the internet of things and things are being more hyper connected and, and whatnot, like realizing and, and understanding that, um, you know, a, a hacker will go to any means to, to do, to get in, inside a system and, and so let's let's like work those things together. Let's like have that kind of journey. Um, you know, I'm I'm committed to bringing things to the left as part of the design um, as much as possible. And then how do we work on our legacy systems to get them? Um, you know, not just accept the vulnerability or just not like accept the risk. You know, but okay, got it. How do we move beyond that to um, but to to actually actively start protecting those things because it is going to be a matter of time before you know a hacker starts to to hit those things too so um <clears throat> really it's just about um let me help you <laughs> as much as possible as, as you are helping me um and, and let's have those conversations as we go through that journey excellent uh kip uh closing remarks please uh, yes. Uh, first, uh, we've got some helpful references um, that uh, are on the next slide. So if we could transition that slide. Um, and then, um, you know, I just uh, want to kind of reiterate that uh, zero trust is a journey. Um, and uh, foundational to zero trust is uh, uh, looking at cybersecurity from uh, always um, never trust, always verify. And that think of uh, your uh, your OT systems and be very vigilant in protecting those OT sy uh, systems. Uh, we do believe that they offer a kind of a soft underbelly, and uh, we want to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, those systems can be uh, cyber hardened using an identity based approach, which is code word for zero trust, which is code word for cyber physical asset protection, uh, which is now being discussed in industrial IoT cybersecurity uh, circles. Um, so there are technologies out there that can um, that can protect those types of systems that are designed specifically for them, um, but also with zero trust and uh, IT uh, best practice principles as well. James? Now, I think uh, Kip hit it on the bell, right, is 
when you're talking zero trust, you've got to think of IT and OT together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we can separate it anymore. Uh, yeah. And, you know, if you really need, uh, it's always good to start the discussion on what's important from your foxhole, from the customer's foxhole. Uh, and, you know, having that trusted advisor in your corner uh, will always help. Uh, as I said before, right, all industry is here to support the customer in state, right, and get into your operational effectiveness. Uh, so I think as we go down this journey together as a team, uh, I think being able to bring multiple teammates together in one room uh, is, is definitely going to uh, allow us to dictate mission sets and, and support solutions. Excellent. Our Colonel Kralikowski, Mr. Gehring and Mr. Ebler, uh, thank you for your time and your expertise today. Uh, thank you to all our viewers for attending and, and asking so many questions. We had a lot to cover. We did our best. Uh, our team will share your email name and question with each uh, panelist. Uh, to address these directly. So you will be uh, still in touch with our experts. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is that you can view this webinar on demand if there was any technical problem. And you can see also previous Signal Media webinars on our website. Remember, it's afcia.org slash signal slash webinar. With this, uh, we conclude our Signal Media webinar. Again, thank you all for being with us today. See you next time. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you.